Good afternoon, or perhaps a good morning to you. My name is Mark, and I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is specifically aimed at digital twin or simulation. We do this together with our partner Perspective, and we have Guido here who will tell us a little bit more about this interesting world of digitalization. So sit back and enjoy. Guido. Yes, yeah, so uh, let's take, uh, let's, let me take you through uh, Perspective and digital twin, and also in the relationship to uh, what we do for land handling. Um, so, a little bit of background, uh, we are Perspective, uh, we are a, a tool set which is based on Unity 3D, which is one of the biggest gaming engines in the world. And we build uh, tools on top of that to make use of what we call real-time 3D simulation. And that may maybe is the next step. Um, but all of course in the context of digital transformation, and I think that is nothing new. Um, uh, during COVID we have seen the impact of uh, the digital transformation needs. Um, and the, the figures speak for themselves. So if you do this correctly, it is a really powerful a way to address the, the future ahead. The thing is that it's not easy. So digital transformation comes not by itself. You really need to know what you would try to do. And mainly also focusing on the companies working in manufacturing. Uh, because we work with steel, we work with robots, we work with products. So it's not all digital yet. So the doing the good transformation, digital transformation is a thing. Mm -hmm. So you really have to invest time and commitment. If you have the vision that almost everything we do has to do with information technology, then you can take steps toward implementation of good digital transformation and digital twin technology. So that's a part of yeah, what I would like to present. Um, of course, digital digitalization itself is also nothing new on its, on, its, on its own. And when you are a manufacturing company, in the past, of course, you when something went wrong, you, you would start to look in, let's say, retrospects what's happening and why did that happen. Yeah, sure. And yeah. now you are collecting data, so now you can say more on, okay, I know why it happened. But the interesting thing is that technology now also makes it possible to do pre-spection, so that you're more or less like the weather forecast, when will things go wrong at a certain yeah, set of uh, assumptions. Exactly, and that is for us important because you know many of our customers are harvestly, uh, harvest time related food manufacturers, and it during harvest time, the the maintenance or uh, schedule cannot be in place. True. So you, they have to be predictive, uh, the, the whole cycle of, of maintenance. Yeah, and the thing is there that it is an unattainable goal. Of course, you can never really predict what happens, but you can make a plume of possibilities. And then you can see, okay, uh, depending on uh, the, the outset of my factory, for example, maybe it will run into an error at an interval in time, uh, given the circumstances now. And that is what uh, digital twin technology can bring you once you implement it correctly over time, because I said it is a, a also a lengthy process to do this correctly, because you first need to know what your process is about and your, and your products. And that also taps into Industry 4.0, the fact that you want to maybe go towards a world in which you can really uh, do production of unique products on your robot line, combining all kinds of products together, which are all unique. To do that correctly, you need to know so much of the context of your system. So then programming one robot is not even the, the key, it is the entire system itself. Sure. And to get there, you probably need to take some steps. Mm -hmm. uh, what I just said is talk, talking about adaptability, that you maybe already use machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. but most companies are not there yet. So you first have to build up your contextual information, getting information out of your robots, a connectivity of your plant and stuff in your systems. And then you work towards visibility and transparency. Mm -hmm. And that's more or less what I would like to take you through to uh, give you some sense on how to address that and what we're also doing with uh, lawn, uh, lawn handling on to set it up for the customer side. Okay, looking forward to this journey then. Yeah, if you look at, uh, most companies are mainly at, let's say, stage four, not stage six. That's uh, like autonomous driving. We are not uh, fully at autonomous plans yet. Uh, stage three or four means that you companies are already starting to use real-time 3D technology. Um, and we see m three main use cases in the type three, four, which arise a lot. Uh, one is to help to do conceptual visualization. That's a, a long use case in this case, to visualize product flow. And that's not that you already have full testing capabilities, but you just visualize flow of product. Once you have that, you can use that set to also look towards virtual testing. And in virtual testing, you test can, yeah, can test almost everything from the robot controllers to the logic controllers to even human interaction. That's exactly what you see here as well. You see an HMI, so an interface for an operator, which can also be addressed in virtual reality or with a HoloLens, for example. 
So you have a, a far more interesting agile loop of development. And one step further even is, once you have done that, you have more or less built a virtual representation of your production facility. Mm -hmm. You can use that to extend it into a, a rich digital dashboard. Okay. And then you can use that one even at in the shop floor while it's in production. Is virtual testing only for engineers in, uh, for example, uh, a stage of the design phase? Or could you use it also to train, for example, operators? Yeah, you can also do it for, for training of operators, but of course, first you have to build something yeah, to train sure. on. Sure. But yeah, the thing is, you can use the same content. So you don't have to redo everything. We uh, build our technology on Unity 3D. And in that same environment, you can do the conceptual visualization part and the digital dashboarding part. You don't have to re redo it. You don't have to go to other software uh, platform. It's like a roundabout in which you can mix and match the things you want to do with it. In one environment. In one environment. That can, of course, help also in the things that you, you were saying, like planning or uh, training, but also convincing, configuring, looking at routing, looking at optimization, stuff like that, while configuring or building a new facility or production line. So let's dive into the three cases I, I, I sh I've shown a bit more to understand it a bit better. So, for example, system configuration also uh, uh, helps you to uh, create ownership. So with different stakeholders, it's not a static uh, CAD file anymore or just a drawing. It really blows life into a drawing. And it's not an animation. You can flip some parameters and then look, can I still have the same output and throughput? So to get a real sense together with the client or the end customer, what the full solution will be. Of course, it's probably not about the machines, it's about the product. So, so what is the real difference between an animation and a simulation? I always mix them up. Yeah, this is interactive. So if I change things on the fly, it will behave differently. So if I will take out a pouch, it is will, will be gone during the entire process. Right. If I put my hand in one of the, uh, let's say, conveyor parts, it will stop the machine. In an animation, of course, that's not a possibility. I understand. That's yeah, a that's a good explanation. That's a different part in that. And if you have that, the, 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 the one you saw there was on a somewhat lower fidelity level of simulation, but you can bring that to a higher fidelity level. And that means that in this case, we actually test the actual logic of the machine against this simulation. So people are programming the logic of a robot or a logic controller for such a cell with a conveyor system in it. And they can run that in a virtual environment while the, let's say the computer, the PLC, is communicating with that simulation. So reuse of the same content created earlier in the process, also for verification and virtual commissioning, for example. And so that is done, perhaps, like you said, for commissioning and, and testing up front to, to debug or to see if there is collision risks or whatever. Yeah, stuff like that. And could also, let's say, engineers from our uh, customer base uh, try to use this to set up, for example, a new uh, a recipe for a new product setting? Yeah, that's, that's even a possibility. It's something you can even see a bit here. So here you get collaboration. So also from not only the team of, let's say, lawn handling, but even a team outside. This is another case. This is the other material handling, but uh, the, their end customers. So the end customer is maybe an implementation party on, uh, on a certain set that also want to change things in it. They can easily change it in this virtual domain and wow, look how yeah. this will play out. And it Without is losing products or damaging the equipment. Yeah, you can yeah. do it. Also with a VR. So in this case, they do a design loop with VR goggles on. Like this one? <laughs> like that one. And multiple people can be in one place. They can all say certain things about it. And they can even, uh, the same uh, example, put their hand in the machine to look if it will jam without losing the hand. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. And yeah. it's also good testing. So then you really understand how things are happening. And even the UX, so the HMI, is in the, this domain. It can also be out, outside of the domain, but it can also be inside that domain. So. It's like the virtual and the real world are... Picture in picture. Picture yeah. in picture, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, if you then move that a bit further, then you come to the world in which, okay, now I have my plant, now I have my machines, and now I have it even installed. And now I want to see that, that virtual representation, also on my iPad or on my computer, as land manager, but also as a shop floor uh, worker, to understand what I'm doing. Then you can uh, use the same kind of content to have a rich visual dashboard of your facility. And it's, for example, what we do with VDL Netcar, in the Netherlands, in which they, their facility is about a kilometer by kilometer wide, we visualize that entire plant. Yeah, and it then and then makes you could it say better controllable as yeah, well. Yeah, also Otherwise better visual. Yeah, so sure. you, you can also put it in an Excel sheet, but of course we are visual people. Of course. If we are working on a BMW, we would like to see that BMW <laughs> and like to know what door we are putting in that BMW. Yeah. And if you then take it uh, all the way, so going to autonomous level six for a plant, then that simulation almost becomes a necessity because then. A person could program one, let, let's say, AGV or robot, 
But how will all the robots collaborate? It's like an anthill. You cannot program an anthill. So you want to see what will happen once you put in your behavior. You want to train the behavior even on the simulation. And that's what you see here. You see the interplay of what I've just shown in a, let's say, stage six yeah, phase. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, probably something together with London we are going to work towards. First, you need to understand the context of where we are now. And that brings us back to the visibility part. And it's one of the things we are doing now, which one of my colleagues will introduce and also present some demonstrations on. And that has to do with that configuration. We now, together with the LON team, merge some, let's say, the, the modules. And that is then a module of the geometry of, uh, for example, a, a cell or robot, but also the behavior and also how it connects to other parts. And then you more or le less get, get a drag and drop interface in which you can build your line together with the customer, vice versa, get input on it, look at the KPI and the throughput, and even uh, test different scenarios quite easily instead of building, rebuilding the facility here on the, the shop floor over and over again yeah, to test yeah. better outcomes. Yeah. And that's probably a, a good handover moment to give it to my colleague All to right. give you some introduction on that part. Wow, great. I'm looking very much forward to it. Thank you, Guido, for uh, this uh, part of, uh, of the webinar. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Yeah. And uh, let's give it to uh, Ron. Hey, Ron. Hey, Mark. Hi. Thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, if I understood correctly, you are going to give us a live demonstration of what we as LAN and you as Perspective are working on. That's, uh, that's totally correct, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a complex story and we thought we'd uh, give some additional like, live demonstration uh, to show you how this is going to work. Uh, therefore, we go out of the presentation and into Unity 3D, um, where we start our journey um, with already perspective installed to augment its, uh, its capabilities, but it is an engine that is just an empty world, essentially, when you start. Mm -hmm. The product we're creating together is aimed at sales engineers uh, to be able to have a real-time conversation with prospective clients and, and set up in conversation um, a, a product line together. Um, so we were looking for a way to make it uh, a plug-and-play experience uh, to create some basic behavior uh, to set the scene, essentially. Yeah. So it's it's more it's more than only configuring building blocks together, but also have let's say the dynamics behind and all the let's say interesting. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's not out. just static uh, models, but actually already sh showing some flow there. But before we get to that flow, we first need a uh, a sort of starting point uh, of the the setting we're actually in. Usually a client can deliver a blueprint of the building, for instance, such as I now dragged into our uh, empty world. Yeah, very um, recognizable picture, this one. Yeah, yeah well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's already sort of uh, drawn in what this is supposed to be, but you can imagine this can also work uh, from, from scratch with only the outlines of the building. Sure. Um, and what we can do here is, is start adding some uh, physical obstacles uh, that would get in the way of a, of a line, uh, something to take into account. So if I go into environment, I can, for instance, uh, put in a, uh, a pillar that is uh, going to be on this corner, um, a fence that is attached to that, and just by dragging and dropping, uh, creating the essential elements that we need to take into account while building this respective world. But what it's really about, of course, is the modules uh, that that LAN has, but what usually, uh, from what we've understood, is already there in cases like this uh, would be, for instance, uh, the retort modules. Uh, so you see them drawn in here already. Uh, so I can place them uh, exactly at the right spot, which works best if I look from above. Um, but now you see that the model I've used, uh, which is one of the building blocks, uh, is not the same size. So we've created some tooling that you can see it here from the side that enables you to scale the model without losing the, the right proportions uh -huh. of certain elements of this module. So in this case, the legs and, uh, and the cones stay the same shape and just the, the length changes. So uh -huh. I can use it to very quickly uh, make it, uh, turn it into the, the right dimensions and then just by copy pasting um, I can uh, fill up the scene like this, which will already uh, help to create a sense of context, of course, because we want to work towards these um, retorts. We haven't worked out all the modules from LAN yet, uh, but I can show you a few um, that are uh, yeah, introduced earlier in the process. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, for instance, what you see here on the, on the map is a uh, formation belt, which I can also drag into the scene, uh, change the orientation, and again, look from the top to place it on the right position. Uh, here again, we have uh, settings, for instance, how long it should be, um, with every everything scaling with it correctly. So the scaling now of the formation belt and the retorts is in the same in the same scale. Yeah, well, they are not related at the moment, uh, but they are uh, in the same scale as intended for this uh, for this particular for design. For this particular design. Yeah, understand. but they have the same feature of being modular or parametrically uh, adjustable. Understand. Um, well, what we need next is a uh, tray conveyor, which will be on this side. Um, and we're having a ROC, uh, ROC, there's a robot conveyor on the other one. Um, and then, uh, just to introduce a first part of the flow, I'm going to add a robot that is going to be placed here. Um, and with this one, you can start to see um, the, the flexibility of, this, um, of these modules. Um, they can be pre-designed by your engineers so that the sales engineers can easily work with them. So in this case, the robot can see which other modules are in its reach. Oh, so that's I cool. If I take it out of this reach, you see them disappear. Close to this, there is only the formation belt. Uh, for this case, I want it to be there, so all three are there. Uh, I'm going to focus now on the first step, just um, introducing a product, which you can also prepare in this library um, that we built together, but that you can also extend yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to make sure that it puts this uh, product in the scene at the place where we want it to start. So in this case, we're going to uh, snap a product introducer onto the formation belt, because that's the first part of the model we have here. Um, and then for that spawner, I can just drag in the product that we um, that we just put in the scene. And now it knows which one um, to create. And we can simply say, for instance, every eight seconds it will introduce a new product. Now the robot still needs to know uh, what it's supposed to do. Um, so I'm going to add a pickup from the conveyor we just uh, created the product on. And on the robot conveyor, I want it to drop off. Um, now all it needs is a transfer instruction to go from one to the next. Well, there is only one option, which it already recognizes. So when I now press play, we turn, it, we move into runtime. So now we're actually starting the simulation. Already? Already. Wow, uh, within that a goes few minutes. fast. You know, I, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so I'm almost a always a little bit afraid of this. But this sounds or looks very intuitive. Right. Um, and and it, it, that's what it's supposed to do, um, to, to make this first step very intuitive and quick. Um, and as you can see, simple behavior like this is quite easy to um, on the spot plug and play, drag and drop, create. Um, what you can also tell is that the behavior is not truly realistic yet. It just, it, it's a great tool to get the conversation going and to find out what the actual details are. Um, which would be the next step in this evolution of this uh, virtual uh, digital twin. Uh, for which I'm going to uh, another setup that I already prepared, uh, which showcases that once um, we have this basic behavior, we start to really uh, get the conversation going also, uh, in this case, with you uh, as, a, as a client to find out what is the specific behavior that is necessary. Sure. And for instance, the formation belt, well, probably, as you know, it doesn't spawn filled trays, that would be nice, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's start with pouches. Uh, uh, from is that is perhaps stage 12, as explained <laughs> by, uh, by uh, Guido, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's more Star Trek-like. Yeah, uh, yeah, not exactly. there yet. Um, Beam me up, Scotty. But yeah, uh, we can add some more realistic behavior where it's just pouch rows uh, yeah. that are introduced. Okay. Um, and what we've learned from our cooperation is that it moves in tuck times uh, that are specified and that the robot can pick them up at different places depending on uh, how much time it, it has. So in this case, uh, you can see there's already a lot more going on, uh, a lot more details in, uh, in the setup um, by which um, 
the robot still sort of has the same flexibility, mm -hmm. let's say. So it looks a bit more complex in the interface, which is also a work in progress still, but you can still see um, everything it, it has in its reach. If, if I now take it out of reach of the pickup points it wants to grab, and I re-index, then those disappear. So it can really see, you see it in the green lines, uh, what is within reach. Yeah, so it's also uh, a feature to optimize the range with respect to all kinds of elements that are yeah, in exactly. that environment. Um, setting up something like a dead zone where it's not supposed to go is also a very interesting tool to make sure that it responds in a way uh, that, that the process times start to mimic actual reality. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, you see when I, when I start the simulation now um, that the pouches are introduced in a tuck and the lights on front in front of the belt uh, will signify now one gets green that there is a position that is available for a full batch so you can go from a continuous to a batch process. Um, it picks up one of the trays and then uh, releases it there. Um, so this is definitely a step that makes it m more specific for you as a client and also uh, creates the possibility to already step into this world, um, look around in it, um, yeah, actually because you fly can create all kinds of well, perspectives of perspectives in, in this case, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, when when the setup is more complex, you can just fly to the piece uh, you want to see and throughout time. Um, so this is already making it more valuable uh, Absolutely. In, in the next step. Uh, but if you want to make decisions about how many modules you want to use or in what configuration, you actually want to compare different scenarios. Yeah, and explain to our customers why certain uh, lengths or investments on ex additional equipment are necessary, or yep. what would be the benefit or disadvantage if it would not be included. I exactly, yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, what usually works very well in, 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 this, uh, in this part of the process is if you have some quantitative data, some numbers, to support your claims. Yes, of um, course. So that's how we go to the next step in this evolution, yeah. and that's the, the throughput simulation, of which we have another prototype here. So, so prove it with data. Prove yeah. it with data. So in this case, uh, we've extended again a little bit the setup so that it actually introduces a whole uh, row of uh, empty tray stacks. Um, and uh, a pouch input of four rows for each tuct, so what a pick and place unit would do. Um, and in this case, we can actually also uh, speed up the, the time frame. So we're now working at four times the speed, which helps to um, actually um, get a sense of, of what in, in a longer term uh, is happening within a setup. So in this case, we have a, a certain, I think it's 10 pouch lines per minute of input. And with the throughput simulation on, you can see that for each module, how much their maximum capacity is at the moment and what they're actually doing. And over time, this levels out and shows you what the most, co what the most constraining resource what at the moment is. Exactly. What is the critical uh, chain in the, in the complete picture? Exactly. Yeah. So what's nice about this setup is that there's no loss. There's nothing uh, the robot can't keep up with. Everybody uh, is in the green zone. Exactly. Um, but you see that the robot is also not using its, its full potential. Um, so we can increase the input of this, uh, of this line. And like... Um, uh, let me see at the spawner. What Guido mentioned is that you can change things in real time instead of in, a, in an animation where, where you can't. So, so yeah. now we can, uh, we can check if the robot can still keep up. Um, and in this case, it will it keep looks up fast. <laughs> at first. But as, as the numbers come up, you can already see that the introduction of the pouches outperforms the robot. So. It's going to take a little while, but eventually uh, we're going to create a loss. So maybe if I speed up the time even a little bit further, you can actually see it happening. So we're now at uh, 22 pouch rows per minute, and it's creeping to the back already. Working hard, uh, the line, but... Uh, it doesn't really look very comfortable, I think. Uh it, it is something to get used to, to, get, uh, to see it also work at its speed. Yeah, correct. 
Um, but it does allow you to, to sort of look ahead in time, of course. Yeah. And of course, I could have said it at, um, at a higher rate that it, it simply cannot produce. But probably this is closer to what is happening in, in real life. That I it's think you're absolutely that right. It's right at the border of what it can and cannot do. So that's why it's interesting that these values, you see them leveling out and you, and you, yeah, you reach a point where you're comfortable. Or you, see you can make your stage. decision like, okay, a loss of um, maybe 50 pouch lines per minute, I will take that if that means that my robot can work on full capacity all the time. Yeah. So now we see we have a loss of about 55 pouches per minute. Um, so this could, al could also mean, well, that's not what I want, but I do have that uh, input. So now I want, a, um, want to see what happens if I introduce a second robot, because then they can divide the work. Uh, now one robot will handle the pouches and one robot will handle uh, the trays. And with the, with the same settings, we will, as you can expect, now see that there will be enough capacity to keep this rhythm going. But this um, is really fantastic. Because with even room for growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can really look at present scenarios. You can already anticipate on future scenarios. Right. And uh, translate that directly into a layout, which you already have seen yeah. simulated. At and work. what you can also see I in this case is that the, the tray robot actually has more time than it needs. It mm -hmm. has to wait for the other robot um, to get out of uh, its space. Um, and yeah, if, if, if you compare this to, to the more traditional way of, of calculating uh, a more like numbers twin mm -hmm. uh, in, in, for instance, something like Excel, it's very hard to imagine uh, how these interactions will take place and when and how to optimize them, especially once this uh, setup becomes more complex and more modules are affecting each other. Um, exactly. So this, this visual uh -huh. element that we talked about before is, um, yeah, it, it, it's very human yeah. in a way. These are just, um, yeah, the first iteration of what kind of feedback you want with these numbers. We're working together to figure out like what do our clients want, um, there, there's so much data that comes out of these models. Um, we got to be the filter, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so w we will continue this this journey to the optimum uh, middle ground. And in the meantime, like we're also experimenting with how you can make the experience even more um, immersive, uh, because that's another advantage of using a platform like this. What does immersive mean? Me more realistic, or how no, how that that it's more imaginable. Okay. That you really feel like you're in this simulation because now you can look around, zoom in, zoom out, but really stand in ah, the that center like of in it. a virtual uh, world that you stand inside it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So uh, I will just show quickly a small movie. You can uh, try it out yourself after this. Um, it's um, a, a similar setup, uh, but then played on the on the Hololens. Uh, in your office. In our <laughs> office. Yes. <laughs> Um, where the sense of scale really <laughs> uh, comes out well. Uh, so you can actually walk around these models and I mean it's, it's a screen capture from the HoloLens itself, it only captures one eye and doesn't project black, so um, it, it, it feels truly different when you're like in it, but yeah. uh, just to give you a sense of this was a matter of installing another plugin um, and streaming it straight to this device. Yeah. So that's I think uh, another example of, of how uh, flexible, uh, mm -hmm. a digital twin can operate, and and like you mentioned, you don't have to start over every mm -hmm. time. You just mm -hmm. build upon it and yeah. zoom into a specific part, maybe uh, in in more detail. Yeah. Um, but for a sales engineer, we hope this can truly help to to get the conversation to the level that you want it to be at. I I think you don't have to hope. I'm convinced it will help. Yeah, yeah, that's it will help hear. for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that's I, I guess uh, what uh, what I wanted to show today. Uh, well, you know work. already, yeah, because uh, we are working together, but we are really looking forward to this because we see this definitely as the future. And you want to show value to customers right. related to your equipment and not only the equipment itself. Mm -hmm. So I think this is uh, really, uh, yeah, the right path forward. So, Ron, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Also, uh, Guido, uh, he's out of the picture, <laughs> but I also thank uh, Guido very much. So, um, yeah, ladies, gentlemen, if you have any further questions, you can also address us at info at lanhandling.com or Ron. Or us at info at perspective-software.com. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.